Karen is the founder and CEO of the Norwegian intercultural educational company, Ellis Culture, found at ellisculture.com. She's an educated IT engineer with more than 30 years professional experience working from some of Norway's largest international companies. She was born and raised in Norway and has been a leader for multicultural teams in Norway and globally in countries such as Ukraine, India, England, Malaysia, and Tanzania. As a result, she has developed a unique understanding of what it means to work with Norwegians. Since 2008, she has been an educator and cultural trainer for companies and job seekers worldwide looking to learn more about work and life in Norway. The courses she has developed on work in Norway have been attended by several thousand people and are very popular at Norwegian universities. Her books about working with Norwegians and applying for jobs in Norway, which you can find on ellisculture.com or on Amazon, have been translated into several languages and is an excellent guide to the Norwegian in the workplace. She has also developed an e uh, learning, sorry, she has also developed e learning courses working with Norwegian and applying for jobs in Norway, which can be found on ellisculture.com as well. In addition to being the CEO of Ellis Culture, Karen Ellis has been the honorary consul of Estonia in Bergen since 2014. You can find Karen on Facebook and LinkedIn by looking for Ellis Culture or by visiting her website, ellisculture.com. Hey, welcome, Karen, to this podcast. I'm so honored to have you as the first guest on this Working With Us podcast to learn about working with Norwegian. And as far as I know, you're the only native Norwegian that is actually teaching foreigners about working in Norway. Is that correct? Yes, as far as I know, I am the only Norwegian doing this. Yes. Mm. Yeah, that's great. And that's sort of the 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 essence of this podcast as well. We want to talk to you because you are native and we want to share, you know, how it is to work in Norway and to get the real essence of, of work life in Norway. For someone who has been born and raised there, they can tell from the inside. It's sort of the insider story about working with Norwegians. And um, before we start with some of the sort of questions I have for you and the conversation we're going to have going forward, um, I want to talk a little bit about something that I'm Norwegian. So I want to talk a little bit about something that's very important to the Norwegian work culture and mentality and that's the coffee um because i remember when i was living in norway many years so yeah i see you have a coffee there already when i was working in norway one of the most important thing is that you as as a leader or a manager you always need to make sure that there's coffee available and even if you're working in an office or you're working remotely like i do I always need to have good, it doesn't have to be good coffee. It just has to be coffee. You need to have coffee available and you need to have it so you can, you know, talk to people or relax or how, how does it work? Like, what's your experience of this? And, and give us a little bit of insight about the coffee culture of, of Norwegians. Oh, yeah. We absolutely love coffee. And if you're offered coffee in Norway, it will usually be black because most people drink black coffee. But in an office environment, um, Norwegians are not very good at small talking, really. We don't small talk much. But then we do drink a lot of coffee. And coffee is almost like a social lubricant. So a lot of problems are solved by the coffee machine. So yeah. if you're going to work in Norway, it's very important to take part in the coffee talk and not just sit and work, uh, work all the time. Because by the coffee machine, you can talk about anything. Uh, it could be private problems, but it could also be problems at work. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's very and, and then yeah, I know it's super important. And as I mentioned, it's it's not actually the quality of the coffee is not that important because I remember when I worked at the a place and they bought like the the cheapest coffee they can get because we we were drinking so much coffee that it became an expense in the end. So they just decided to buy like the cheapest coffee you could find, and yeah, no one complained about. The only thing they would complain about if it if it was empty, that was the complaint. <laughs> and they can say, ah, this coffee is really not tasty, but you know, that was, that's a not important thing. It has to be black, no milk, no sugar. That's sort of optional, very optional. And uh, I'm the living in Italy now. I'm like seeing that this is like a very strange concept for the Italians to see because they have the little espresso or the cappuccino, right? Yes. So, yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, um, for me, it's, it's something I've learned by, by living abroad about Norwegians from my own culture. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any anything you want to add on that? No, it's uh, it's true. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, something I will always do in this kind of podcast is I will go over kind of a um a list of facts about Norway because I want to put Norway on the map for people that don't know much about the country in itself. They might have heard about it 
from uh, media or read about it somewhere else, but maybe you don't really know where it is and, and what it's all about. So I will just give you some basic facts and I will read the, those up now. So, and then we can we can discuss later, Karen, about um, um, these facts if it's necessary, or we just go straight to the questions. So just without further ado, just, just let me just dump, jump into some of the facts here. So Norway is a country, it's located in the Northern part of Europe. Uh, they are part of Scandinavia with borders to Sweden in the East and Finland and Russia in the north. And Norway is a long stretched country from south to north. It's divided by a, basically in the middle of Norway, there's some, some mountains. So you have like the east where most of the people live, actually southeast, like around the capital, which is Oslo. And then you have the other side of Norway and then you have the north. So we Norwegians usually say Norway is like the south, you have the southerners and you have the northerners. And I think you're in Bergen, right? So. What's your, like, because I think that a foreigner might not really see this. We are only 5.4 million people in Norway, but it's such a long stretch country. And then it's, this mountain divide actually, in some sense, have shaped a little bit of our culture. Don't you agree? Yes, we have cultural differences in Norway as well. And I spend a lot of time in Oslo since Oslo is the capital. But as you rightly said, I live in Bergen. And for instance, when I am in Oslo, I use my, if I use my Bergen irony, because in Bergen we use a lot of irony, it's not always understood. So I have stopped using my Bergen irony when I am in Oslo. So that's one of the differences. But there yeah, are many yeah. differences. And in the North, uh, people are known for being much more friendly, much more open and direct. So in the north, they have a juicy language. So they will use words that would not be considered acceptable in the south. And uh, also with jokes, they have very juicy jokes. So yeah. it's, it's very interesting. You have, we do have cultural differences within Norway. Yeah. And obviously not to confuse the listener, the Norwegian culture is very sort of similar in, in sort of the work life. This is more on a personal level. We have, you know, this, this cultural difference, especially the language in the North is a very interesting. I think that someone should do a research on that because it's a quite an interesting topic to discuss, actually. Yeah. Um, OK, so just go for a little bit more with the, the details. So the official name of Norway is Kingdom of Norway. So we have a king, Harald. Uh, he's very popular and you never should talk anything bad about the king if you are the king is always a very dear uh friend of the norwegians i would say um we are uh, also have a prime minister that runs the government so we are um politically uh, that's that's how it works um norway is best known for excellent seafood spectacular nature the vikings and being really good at winter sports so if you look at any statistics about winter olympics you will see that norway is number one in terms of uh, medals and we are very proud of that as norwegians um also norway is consistently ranked as one of the best places in the world to, to live according to the human development index um i think at the moment we are number two on that list actually uh, we've been number one for many many years um what number two and number one is not a big difference um the living standard in norway is high and so is tax still a few Norwegians have any issues accepting the increased tax burden as they understand how it contributes to society. The high standard of living and taxes means that most Norwegians are paid, on average, more in salary than most people around the world. This is something to, to consider when you're working with Norwegian or if you're a company moving into Norway. In general sense, um, they, accept, um, they expect a, a higher salary than if you're working from, if you have a, a foreign company. Um, Christianity is the most prominent religion, although religion is not very important for most Norwegians, other than the traditions it has brought along. So we still go to church for um, during Christmas and, and weddings and, and baptism and everything is still a, a, a traditional thing. But I think that most Norwegians now are more, you know, open minded. And there's also, you know, some um, I think around three, four uh, percent Muslims in Norway now we are very. You see a lot of immigration. It's sort of becoming a very, like a melting pot of different things, and and it's very interesting when you when you look at the society as a whole. Um, the official language in Norway is Norwegian and Sami. So Sami is a language that is spoken by the Sami people in the north. It's not widely spoken, but it is one of the official languages. Um, English literacy in Norway is om among the highest in the world, mainly due to strong emphasis on learning English uh, and exposure to English-speaking media from a very young age. 
Like I remember growing up on the telly, if we had any channels, uh, so I'm born in the 80s, there was like English um, television shows all the time, as if you have the same experience. But we are sort of exposed to English from a very young age. And I think that sort of contributes to, to when we go to school and learn English, we can sort of, you know, use that language, at least listen to it very early on. So um, we, we, we do, most Norwegians speak really good English. Um, we also are very good educated and generally well educated because the schools are very good and we also have free universities. So you have a lot of people with high, higher education in Norway. Um, so let's go over to working in Norway now, because this is the topic of the, of this podcast. So, um, when it comes to the workday, uh, so I'll let Karen give us the insights here, but a typical Norwegian office worker, uh, their workday would between, be between 8 a.m. and 4 p.m. Monday to Friday. Um, and also, in, in, it's also important to understand that the Norwegian, they have excellent job security and also good protection to very solid labor laws and also high union membership in general. Um, as a result, the voice in the workplace is strong and is very essential. So as a leader or manager working with Norwegians, you need to understand that this is sort of part of their mentality. So, um, Karen, I would let you now uh, give the listeners and me some insights into working with Norwegians. Um, so I will just kick off with some questions. I don't know if you have any comments to the facts or that I just mentioned anything you want to mention that I didn't talk about now that is important for the listeners to know. Well, just a little comment on on the te television shows in English uh, and in Norway, uh, they they were not dubbed. We had subtitles, so we were used to listening to uh, English and and getting learning it that way by not having them dubbed. That's something I thought of that could be mentioned. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm 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 I live in Italy, and you can't find. Uh, it's very difficult to find non-dubbed uh, international movies. So it's for me, that's a very, I don't understand it. I think it's a cultural thing as well. It's like it, it helps, you know, with language um, learning to, to listen to something uh, in another language. So that it's definitely something that we, we benefited from growing up. Yeah, mm, I did too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So the first question I have is that, and um, so I read your book. I, I bought your book. I bought the Kindle version, uh, Working with Norwegians. Uh, it's an excellent book. You have it there. Yeah. I didn't have time to to order it in paperback, but I, I found it on Amazon as a Kindle. So I'm very grateful for that. It's an excellent book about learning uh, about Norwegians. And even for me, being Norwegian, it gave me a little bit of insight into things I haven't really considered for a long time. And one of them is the the term called frihet uh, under ansvar, or with freedom comes responsibility. Uh, so what does that mean and why is that important to understand when it comes to the Norwegian in the workplace? I think that's the most important unwritten rule of how everything works in Norway uh, because and it's linked to trust. So according to the World Value Survey, Norwegians are the most trusting people in the world. So we have a lot of trust. Um, so um, in the workplace and everywhere in schools, universities and so on, we like uh, people to have, we trust people. So we give a lot of freedom. But for foreigners who come to Norway, uh, they see the freedom. The freedom is easy to, to see and understand, but it comes with a responsibility. So we have a term in Norway, frihet under ansvar, which means with freedom comes responsibility. So there is an inherent responsibility with that freedom. And the responsibility is, uh, well, the, the, the expectation is that you actively take responsibility for your work, uh, usually without having been told so. Uh, so you will not be told what your responsibilities are. So you need to find out actually what they are. Uh, and then you need to actively take the responsibility and deliver what is expected. And only then, when you do this, will you get the freedom. So the freedom comes with a package. Yeah. And this was instilled in me in at a very early age before I started school. So my mother explained it to me, and uh, I had to do my I I I had to um, with my schoolwork. I had to work independently with my schoolwork with my homework. 
And my mother always expected me uh, to take the responsibility without her explicitly telling me to do my homework. Yeah. And it's the same experience I had growing up. It was like, okay, here's your homework. And trying to go to my parents and ask for any help. It was more like, well, you figure it out. You know better than me. And yeah. although they, I didn't know better than them, but it was like we tried, they tried to give us, you take care of yourself. We are very, you're independent. We want to, I don't know if they thought about this, it was just like their, their, their way of sort of talking to us as kids. Um, and this is obviously something that has been instilled in us growing up as well when we come to the workplace. And, um, and um, it's, it's super interesting when I read about this because I think maybe a lot of foreign, not only the, the, the people coming to work, they, they fail to understand it, but also maybe managers and leaders that they might feel a necessity to um, sort of over manage or micromanage Norwegians. And it wouldn't really work that well because that's not freedom which comes responsibility. That's like, I'm telling you what to do. So I don't know if, a micromanager will be really successful in working with Norwegians. It it would be absolutely unsuccessful. Uh, I think that that would not work with Norwegians at all. Norwegians uh, are almost allergic, I would say, to micromanagement. So if they feel that their leader, their boss, is breathing down their neck all the time and controlling them and not giving them trust and freedom, I, I I don't think they will stay in that job. In fact, I left a job myself um, several years ago, a job that I loved because I had a, a, a non-Norwegian manager who was trying to micromanage me and I I left. <laughs> yeah, no, it, uh, that's something uh, I think that I also felt that on my uh, sort of uh, personally when I was working in Norway many years ago, but I was from a Norwegian manager. So you know, that's always happens. It can happen with, with everyone. And I think it's just uh, uh, about training and leadership uh, training in general that can sort of solve a lot of this, especially for foreigners coming in. Um, I, I okay. would like, Paul, if I may, I would like to add a fact that um, according to the World Value Survey, again, uh, Norwegians are the most in independent people in the world. So when asked Norwegians what is important for their children to learn at school, it's actually independence. And Norway is actually on top of the scale there. So um, working independently is very important for Norwegians. Hmm. Yeah. And and so just let's just segue to the next question I have here now. So how would you how would you describe a typical person from Norway? Well, it's very risky to describe uh, a typical person because it can easily become very stereotypical. And as we have already talked about, uh, there are cultural differences uh, in Norway too. And as we all know, we are all individuals. But on the other hand, um, being stereotypical for a moment can be helpful because also because it will help us navigate in a complex world. So it's like the first guess about Norwegians. Um, but also how you perceive Norwegians depends on your reference point. So when I say that Norwegians can be very shy and reserved, it depends on how reserved and shy you are as an individual and people in your culture. But I would say that we tend to be a bit shy. So um, a typical example of that is that Norwegians will not speak to strangers on the bus or in the lift and so on. Um, and, and it can take time to make Norwegian friends. Um, so people who come to Norway often find the social life harder to deal with than expected. But uh, once you've made a Norwegian friend, uh, they, um, friendships are on a long-term basis. So it's a little bit more difficult to make friends, but, uh, then, um, we have friends that, I have friends that I've had all, almost all my life. So it's definitely on a long-term basis. But at work, uh, Norwegians can seem a little bit uh, remote and by that a bit uninterested in your work. But it, this is not the fact. Uh, this is linked to two things. First of all, it's linked to the trust that I've mentioned already. So they will trust you to do your work and to ask if you have any questions. The second thing is that they are giving you uh, space. So they want you to have space to get on with your work, develop your own methods, 
add your personal touch without anyone breathing down your neck. And once you figure out these rules, uh, people will usually tell me that they love it once they've understood the rules, but it can be a bit difficult to get started in this um, kind of environment. Hmm. Yeah, and I think it, it, it's also, it's, this is something that uh, we can talk about because it's interesting when it talks about that with making friends and the social skills of the Norwegian in general, especially when we talk about somehow the, the way that the world has sort of it, the world of work has been shaped in the last few years, uh, seeing that people are more working from home, they get isolated and these things. And I think um, th this makes it a little bit more difficult maybe to manage a team of Norwegian that work from home because they need that, you know, that social lubricant because they're not, they're not, they're not, they're shy, but like in a way that it's just their, their personality, sort of their cultural trait that they don't really go up to strangers and talk to them. They want to be included more. And I think um, if I can go to the next question there is like, what is the sort of the perception of, of, uh, of the Norwegian in terms of work life and, 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 and career and also, you know, the personal life, because this work and career is two different things. So you work, but career is a long-term thing that you do for many, many years. And what is sort of the typical, like what's the perception that Norwegian have in terms of this? You mean work and work-life balance? Yeah, work-life that... balance and, and like yeah, long-term yeah. careers. Yeah, we have a very strong work-life balance um, and uh, leaders in Norway uh, or, um, respect that the employees also have a life outside of the workplace. So Norwegians will typically leave work at four o'clock uh, without feeling guilty and they will leave before the boss. I mean, they will not think twice about, uh, so this concept of waiting until the boss has left before you can leave is totally strange and alien to Norwegians. And uh, you will also find uh, if you have meetings in the afternoon that Norwegians will start to leave the meeting and say that I have to pick up my children in the kindergarten. Uh, and this is also acceptable in Norway. Um, so there is, among foreigners in Norway, there is um, a misconception, I think, uh, that Norwegians work short days and they work very little. And I think this is based on misunderstanding because Norwegians are uh, very efficient in the work in the time when they are at work. They have uh, short breaks, short lunch break, for instance, only half an hour. And many people put in extra hours in the evening, um, for instance, after the children are in bed and so on. And this is not visible to the outside always. Uh, so I think um, th there is a productivity index where Norway scores quite high, actually. So this is a misconception about the uh, not working hard. But the days are definitely shorter. And I lived in London in my younger days, and I decided to come back to Norway because of this. When I saw the long days that people worked in London and with the commuting and everything, how little time they had with their family, I decided, no, I want to go back to Norway. So that's what I did. Mm. Yeah. You think that, that it's, a, it's an interesting when you talk about um, that culture of the sort of Norwegians working ab abroad as well in London. I had a, one of my best friends who was living in London. He always told me about the long working days and I asked him why. Well, it, what? And he said, it's an expectation. But And I said, it's a written expectation. No, it's just the way the culture works, mm. which, as you say, is very different from how the culture works in Norway. It's, even though, like, I think it's like, okay, it's important to stay at the office uh, very long because you want to prove something to your manager or leader. Uh, mm -hmm. which is not that important for even the leaders in Norway, wouldn't you agree, would not like they would maybe look at you saying, OK, that person is working really hard and very long, but maybe they don't. They Maybe they think that person is a little bit weird for doing that. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely. And I find that many foreigners uh, come to me and say, oh, there's like uh, racism almost in Norway that. Uh, foreigners are not promoted as leaders. And then I ask them, oh, do you take um, a part in the social activities at work? Do you drink coffee with your colleagues? Uh, do you talk to your colleagues? Do you um, spend, have lunch with them and so on? And then they say, no, I work the hardest. And then I haven't been promoted. Well, uh, so this is a difference. 
uh, in Norway from many other countries that this, uh, having a good work environment actually is more important than anything else. So when Norwegians choose a job, when, uh, the, when they ask what is mo most important when they choose a job, it is not salary. Salary is number two. And uh, what is rated as number one is having a good work environment. Mm -hmm. And leaders know this. So it's very important to have a, a good work environment. And this is much more important than having really long days and working the hardest. Yeah. And I think the learning you can take from this, if you're listening, is that especially if you're uh, looking at hiring Norwegians in a, in a work from home uh, environment, is that if they are not online at all times, you shouldn't think that they are doing this to not be um, an active participant in your work. It's their life. So they have, they are probably um, having dinner with their uh, family because they usually dinner is like four or five or they're out skiing in the winter or doing some activities with their children. And that's just the reality. So it's not that they don't want to prove to you that they are working hard. They will do that in other ways um, by working hard when they should be working, not in the after hours. Also, I think we didn't mention that, but one of the things that I learned living abroad is that Norwegians have a, um, uh, they like overtime paid or um, I don't know, avspasering, which is like paid leave basically in a way where you are take some time off. It's also very common and, and accepted. So I don't know if you, because this, 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 this term about overtime and how, and you've paid really well sometimes if you have to work like during the red days, you know, on a Sunday or on a holiday, you, you get paid fairly, you contributed fairly well to stay that extra hours. Isn't that correct? Yes, unless you are a leader uh, where you normally don't have overtime uh, paid, uh, then you do get compensated quite well for working uh, overtime. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And, and I think that that is something that if you bring that into the uh, eight to four mentality, and if you have an expectation as a leader that you are not going to pay them to work eight to six, they because they are Norwegian, so they have this thing about, you know, th those two hours extra, I should be rewarded for those two hours if I'm going to stay and I need to plan that and need to agree on that and everything. Mm -hmm. So I think this is something that is important to understand um, uh, because you would get very uh, uh, disgruntled Norwegian employees if you if you don't take this into account. Yes, especially if you ask them to work like two hours extra a day. But if if uh, if you don't ask them, they might put in two hours extra without anything uh, just to get their wo uh, work done. But once overtime is demanded, they are expected to be paid for it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah and, and that's an important expectation you made, like what you said there, because sometimes we Norwegians do work extra and we don't expect anything in return for that, because sometimes it's just we want to finish the work. We, as I said, freedom with freedom comes responsibility. So we have a lot of benefits of flexibility in the workplace. So if we work two hours extra on a, on a Thursday, we, and it's not demanded we're not going to go and say hey we need to pay me for those two hours hmm. but then i would I, I would work like that but then i would also expect flexibility if i wanted to go uh, say to the hairdresser or something in working hours i would so i would kind of take that time off at some other time as long as i delivered my work yeah yeah so it work, would work both ways hmm. yeah yeah hmm. okay um Great. This is this is excellent learning and excellent knowledge. Um, are there any other common? You, you mentioned that this is sometimes a misconception about Norwegians that they work. Uh, you know, um, they're lazy in some sense because they don't work on Friday, so they take the day off early. Are there any other uh, misconceptions or something that you have come across that is sort of um, uh, that that maybe comes along and people sort of accept it, and then it's no context to it. Is there any other thing that you can that comes to mind? Yeah, I, I would say a, a common misconception is that some people from Europe or from uh, maybe from the US, from other Western cultures, um, uh, assume that working in Norway will be super easy because it will be very easy to their own culture. Um, and uh, uh, this is a, a big mistake, actually, because uh, Norwe the Norwegian workplace culture has some traits which sets it clearly apart from uh, and makes it more challenging to work in Norway than in many, many other cultures. And this is something that they should um, be aware of. Mm. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, what do you do when you hear those misconceptions in a, in a learning setting? Is it something that is hard to to make them understand? Because sometimes, you know, a misconception can be, uh, it's so easy, especially if you go online and you try to just Google what is wor working with Norwegians. And obviously that's why you are here talking to me because you're mm. a native one. Mm. A lot of this misconception comes from, I don't know where they come from. Is that sort of a, a media thing or... Um, yeah, so, so, so how do you work when when it comes to this and trying to sort of tell them that uh, I, I would I, I would assume as I said because the sort of the the Americans they come in they have this idea and they might be very stringent on having this idea because that's what they believe. Um, do you have any experience of of, of working with uh, companies or, or clients or something like this? Yeah, yeah. I I I tell them that the biggest challenge is um, dealing with the lack of clarity in Norway. And that is what makes Norway very challenging uh, um, to work in. Now, I, I had in my past, I have been a global sourcing manager. So I have been responsible for outsourcing uh, IT uh, activity and IT tasks and building up teams in other countries. And I found that Norway is, uh, and I say to Norwegians, we are probably the most challenging people to work with because because of this extreme independence, so we don't explain anything. And, and there can be a lot of misunderstandings linked to this. Uh, and I think people who come to Norway need to, uh, or are going to work with Norwegians need to be, uh, need to understand this and bring some clarity into the environment. So this is what I, I do in my courses and my books, I give people like a survival kit. So how to survive in such a, an unclear environment. Yeah. yeah. No, no, it's uh, definitely something that uh, you will experience really fast when you, when you get to a Norwegian uh, work environment, um, that lack of yeah. clarity. Yeah. Maybe I could elaborate what I mean about lack of clarity. Yeah, please. Uh, so when uh, research shows that a lot of people who, when they start working in Norway, they are told that here's your desk, here is your computer, here is your phone. Um, uh, just ask if you have any questions, good luck. And then they are left to their own devices without any guidance. Uh, so uh, the lack of clarity, I mean, in Norway, there is uh, usually a lack of guidance, a lack of um, clear expectations then a lack of follow up because there is so much trust. So when we think that people are working on something, we believe everything is super duper fine unless we hear something. And then there is lack of feedback. And especially if the feedback is negative, uh, then Norwegians don't like to give negative feedback. So you could say that we are a bit shy of conflict. Uh, so then you have it from the beginning, lack of uh, of uh, lack of clear expectations, lack of follow up, lack of feedback. It's in all instances in the process uh, there can be a lot of misunderstandings when dealing with Norwegians. Yeah, mm. um, yeah. But that, so it's a good segue to to another question I have here, which is like, what would be if you're working with Norwegians, even if you're if you're a colleague, or maybe more if you are a leader trying to sort of motivate them. What's something that makes a Norwegian particularly demotivated? Uh, well, I think not giving them enough space to, to work independently. And if you were, uh, like I said before, if you were trying to micromanage them and if you don't give them trust, uh, they will, um, uh, that will be very hard for them because they will want to work independently. But strangely enough, I said about lack of clarity, Norwegians also like uh, leaders who set clear uh, expectations and clear uh, directions. So that is something I advise also for Norwegian leaders to do, because it, a clarity in the workplace makes everyone, I mean, less misunderstandings and so on. But definitely uh, letting people, giving people space to add their personal touch without interfering a lot. And, and trusting them is something that would keep them engaged and happy. Hmm. Yeah, and it sort of ties ties a little bit back to the freedom. With freedom comes responsibility as well, because you want to give yeah. them that freedom. Absolutely. Mm. Yes, yeah. you need to. Mm. And I guess that's also what will then say. Um, it's what keeps them happy and engaged at the workplace when you're given that 
Is that right? Yes, exactly. Yes. Because Norwegian employ uh, employees will not automatically respect their leader because of a status or title um, uh, or authority. They will respect their leaders uh, because of uh, other things, um, such as uh, being good role models, listening to their employees and involving the uh, listening, listening to their employees and involving them in the decision process. That is what makes Norwegians respect um, their leaders. Mm. No, no, it's uh, it's um, it it sort of it paints a picture here of 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 this kind of to, to give the freedom, which in general sense should be, I think, from all leaders. I think that if you look at this as a style of leadership, it's it's a model I think can be appreciated anywhere in the world uh, mm. because this is usually, if you look at motivational theory, um, you give people the independence to make their own decisions, they usually perform better than if you're very you know, micromanaging them. Yes. Mm. Okay. Um... So I think if I can just add that, I think leaders who are going to work with Norwegian employees um, need to, uh, to keep them motivated to adapt the leadership style a bit, um, especially if, if it's in Norway. Uh, then in particular, because if, if they are going to work in Norway, then uh, there is an expectation that people who work in Norway will adapt to the Norwegian leadership style. If it's outside of Norway and Norwegians are working uh, for a leader outside of Norway, then it's more debatable. But at least the leader should be aware of these things. Mm. Yeah, no, no, that's definitely true. And I think that the, the second aspect you mentioned there of, of people working um, say you have an American uh, boss based in the US and have a Norwegian team based in Norway, um, what they should think about is also you want to get the best out of the Norwegians from the team there. So Ooh. it's sort of like the, that's the complexity of having, especially if you're thinking about the remote world of work and people working from home, companies that have like thousands of people working from home, that working work culture is very d different from every every country and this is why it's important to understand the the basics of you know what what motivates someone that is Norwegian even though maybe you only have one Norwegian on the team it's still important that you as a leader that's why it makes it so complex to be a good leader in a remote setting that's sort of one of the things that um that I talk a lot with my clients about you know that it's not like okay you have one from India one from Norway one from um from Japan and one from the US okay do you manage them the same maybe you have to adapt your style to each one of them uh, to make yeah. them happy and productive. And I, I think such a mix can be a very good mix because they have different um, different advantages, yeah, different strengths coming from different cultures. And research shows that diverse teams perform better than homogeneous teams. So, But they need to be managed in the right way. Yeah, absolutely. I think the team in itself will thrive if they can work mm -hmm. together, but the manager needs to mm -hmm. have that, you know, understanding that... Uh, give the Norwegian the freedom, but maybe be more structured with um, the Japanese, for example, you know, something like that. There's like differences in the way they have to manage them, and which yeah. is complex. It's, it's a it's a complex uh, thing, but it, the outcome in the end can be really good. Okay, um, so the next question I have here uh, on my list is that, I don't know if you already mentioned that, but I think it's always interesting to hear examples of where, um, say, a, a, a misunderstanding has happened in, in a sort of a cultural context that maybe you have something from your experience um, of either companies or, or people not maybe really understanding the, the sort of the, the Norwegian culture. Any examples that comes to mind? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think the, the classical one is maybe um, that some, pe some people from very hierarchical cultures will always say yes to the boss. So saying yes and not delivering is the worst. I, I tell people in my courses, that's absolutely the worst thing you can do in Norway. You you need to say, no. if the answer is no, you need to tell your boss and explain why you're unable to do something. So saying yes is, uh, uh, we had a lot of this when we had Indians, uh, when I worked with Indians. <laughs> so we needed uh, to adapt quite a bit there. Uh, and then you have the Norwegian language, and this is uh, maybe uh, not so well known. Um, so first of all, um, foreigners complain and say that Norwegians are not very polite because they don't say please when they speak English. 
but this has this is linked to the language first of all the translation of please is often translated into an expression of three words which is much longer and is more pleading like you're begging for something so this is the reason why Norwegians will leave out please when they speak English and instead of saying please they will say uh, they will express something more indirectly um, and the most typical expression is when they say it, it would be nice if you could do this um, by the before the end of the week and many foreigners in Norway they perceive this as an option you can do it if you feel like it or if you have the time but it's not meant as an option it's actually an order so it means please do it so this can also be an under a misunderstanding and other um uh, another uh, misunderstanding could be where if a Norwegian says can you process the data with when they leave out please um it can be perceived as are you able to process the data so the answer may be yes but for the Norwegian it means can you please do it so that's another misunderstanding and, and I mentioned earlier about negative feedback. So Norwegians are not uh, very, um, they don't really like giving uh, negative feedback. So when they do, uh, they often say something positive, a softener first in the beginning to soften the real message. And I discovered uh, when I worked with Ukrainians uh, that Ukrainians did not understand this way of giving feedback. So what they heard, so it was the Ukrainian team leader, when he received feedback from the Norwegian team leaders, uh, he, he typically heard, oh, the programmers are doing a good job, but this and that needs to be improved. And he always heard uh, they're doing a good job. And then all of a sudden, uh, in uh, perceived by the Ukrainian leader, uh, the Norwegians would go with a big bang and say, oh, we've had enough of this. We need some new people on the job because they are not delivering. And then the Ukrainian leader would come to me and said this was very strange because he had received positive signals all the time. So this is something to be aware of that depending on how feedback is given in your culture. So this is a cultural thing. You may not pick up the negative sig signals from Norwegians. So this was very interesting uh, for me. So I started writing about it in my books after that. Mm. Yeah, no, that's uh, super interesting. And I think uh, just want to go back to the one about please. Uh, also, just in, in, in other cultures in, in, in Italy, where I'm living, where they say per favore after a sentence. And I, I don't use it. And my girlfriend is always nagging me about this. You should say please. And, you know, it's like, OK, I should. I know I've been living abroad for many years and I probably adopted it. But it's also when you're like your 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 men mental mode is like it's so it sounds so formal. I actually have a story, uh, a personal story about this, because I I used to live in, in New Zealand for many years where I learned my English, basically. Like um, and I remember when I came back to to Norway and I went to the supermarket and I was very polite. And the, the lady behind the cashier was like uh, asking me, oh, you're very nice. Because I I did like I said please and thank you and everything for everything and she gave me the bag and it was just like oh I, I because I was so adjusted to a more uh, like I wouldn't say a polite way of speaking but just the way they they communicate in a different culture that it was weird for her to hear this from a Norwegian so this is a very yes. true 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 thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think also another just that because I also have obviously many examples of this is the, the and maybe you can you can mention this as well. I don't know if this is something that happens, but I see a lot of um, I get a lot of messages online from, you know, people from different cultures. They are very uh, formal. You know, they say like they're sir and, and all that. And that's not very I think I, I feel weird when people call me sir or they tell me dear because, yeah, they mm. just. Talk to me because we are very. It's not we are very. You know, even like the boss. There's not really a hierarchy in in Norway. No, there's very little hierarchy. We are very egalitarian in Norway, where everyone is considered equals and should and have more or less the same rights. So salary levels are very um, similar in Norway. So, for instance, a professor at a university earns only a little bit more than uh, the cleaner uh so small salary differences and uh 
And we use first names with everyone, including like the prime minister. Uh, so uh, first names are common. And it, it's interesting that you say deer, because deer in Norway, uh, the Norwegian translation of deer is much stronger. So it's almost like darling. So this is why I think Norwegians don't use deer so much in letters uh, and so on, because it's uh, it's very it's something I would use for my closest uh, family and friends. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. yeah. so it's, it's again, it's language mm, also. Yeah. OK, um, we are ending. Uh, we, are, we are getting close to the end. I have a couple of more questions. Um, one of them, uh, I think we can. Uh, we had talked quite a lot about what sort of makes the Norwegians uh, motivated, what makes them demotivated and how they are in the workplace. Maybe if you're listening now, maybe, oh, why should I hire someone from Norway? And that's my question to you. Why should someone hire a Norwegian to work on their team? What what value do they bring to the team? Yeah, I think you should hire a Norwegians if you want a, a creative and innovative environment. Uh, because no Norwegians are not afraid to challenge established decisions and ideas. Um, and also, if you want people to be able to work independently without a lot of guidance and instructions along the way. And Norwegians, an, another advantage with Norwegians is that they often take a more holistic responsibility. So um, more than just doing um, their job. So they will often show initiatives to contribute uh, to um, to improvement in the um, environment and so on. So continuous improvement. So I, I think these are the main advantages of hiring Norwegians. Hmm. Hmm. No, that sounds good. And uh, obviously, uh, um, I have worked with a lot of Norwegians in my life and 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 I also work with a lot of non-Norwegians in my life. And there is a clear distinction between I would say for me personally, it's um, it really depends on where in the world you are living and who you work with. But we as Norwegian, we have a, I think a very st strong uh, pride in in doing our work well and like doing it like when we have a task and we are given that job, we want to do it and we don't want to disappoint uh, because we are not like we are a social society where we all work together. We pay taxes uh, that are high, but we know it also contributes to society, even at the workplace. It's sort of like my job is important because if I don't do it well, my colleagues might have a, a problem. So I think it's just it's it's not an individualistic thing to do a job. It's a it's a community thing. Yeah, we are quite team oriented in Norway. So that's important to know. So when I help job seekers, for instance, I I tell them, uh, please, uh, please don't brag about yourself, but you can brag about your team. Um, because teamwork is very highly appreciated in Norway. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, I wasn't supposed to talk about this because I think it can be a long conversation, but you mentioned the word brag, which I think is interesting to talk about in a Norwegian context because we have something in Norway, you can explain it, it's called uh, Janteloven or the law of Jante, mm. uh, which uh, you can, if you are familiar with, um, if you're listening, you're familiar with something called the tall poppy syndrome, uh, which I have in the UK, in the New Zealand, Australia. It's the same same sort of concept and idea. But in Norway, it's really strong. It's a very strong thing. Can you tell us a little bit about that before we move on? Yeah, well, Jan Deloven is fiction. It was written by a Danish author who moved to Norway. And he wrote it to describe um, the Scandinavian urge to fit in with the rest, to, to conform with the rest of the society. So it has 10 rules and all the rules are a flavor of you're not to think you're anything better than us. So if you stick out too much by being either being too rich and flashing your wealth or working too hard in the workplace, much harder than everyone else, or being extremely successful, uh, people will start frowning at you as if you're a bit vulgar. So if you so in Norway, self bragging is almost like a taboo. So in my job seeker courses, I spend a lot of time on explaining how they can promote themselves uh, more indirectly in a tasteful way uh, to the Norwegian um, culture or to Norwegian employers. So this is important to, uh, to know about. Yeah. So so actually, if you work too hard in the workplace, much harder than everyone else and don't drink coffee and don't contribute to the work environment, 
people will start frowning and think that you're just a very cold and machine-like person. Because in Norway, we don't like to recruit machines. We recruit human beings who are also nice to be with. It's very important to be aware of that. So this was Jante Loven. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I will add uh, all the like links to to that uh, to an article about that. I know that you also talk a lot about that in your book. Uh, but it's an actually a very interesting concept to understand because it, it's it's a big part of a lot of Norwegians' way of thinking. Uh, I have a lot of examples of this. Just a family I knew that didn't. They were very wealthy, but they didn't want to drive the nicest car in the city because everybody would look at them to say, "Oh, look at they look at them with a the nice car." And mm. they were so uh, worried about that. So they bought like a cheaper car, even though they could afford the, the nicest car available. So it, it is something that's yeah, really and, cool. Uh, and I mean, I don't have a, I have an electrical car. I don't have the most expensive electrical car uh, because I don't want to be perceived as if I'm flashing uh, anything. So I bought a, a like a medium car. Yeah. <laughs> I think that, because that's something interesting. I, I live in just a one context. I live in Milano. So I like fashion capital. You know, I'm trying to be Norwegian in the fashion capital of the world. It's very complicated sometimes because if I dress very Norwegian, then people will look at me as someone who is standing out as weird. So I have to dress more fashionably, which is very non Norwegian. So <laughs> it's a very interesting, uh, this, this thing is a very um, learned thing that is very hard to get rid of. Yeah. And, but I would like to say that the culture is changing and changing more in that direction, as you're describing, more towards fashion and wealth and so on. And you will see more of it in Oslo. So Oslo, in many ways, is not typical of Norway. So if you have been to Norway and you've been to Oslo and you think you know Norway, then I would say you you don't, because Norway is not actually typical for the rest of Norway. Uh, sorry, Oslo oh. is not typical for the rest of Norway. Yeah. Mm. No, that's what we mentioned at the beginning. So Norway is a long stretch country from, I think that if you fly from Oslo to the top of Norway, it's uh, the same distance as if you fly from Oslo to Rome. Yeah. Uh, so you can imagine it's basically the entire length of Europe is the entire length of, of, of Norway. So you can imagine the people that live under the midnight sun and the dark days in the north, or even the people that live on the west, close to the you know harsh weather there, they have a different upbringing and different style of life and culture. So it, this is something that you will learn more when you when you interact with Norwegians. I think that Oslo is good because you will find people from everywhere in Norway, mm. because that's where they flock to to sort of find work um, most of the time. Mm. Um. Okay. Um. Okay. So the last things I have now basically then goes more to trying to um, um, help the listeners to get some some value uh, that they can they reach out to later. So what would you recommend someone either wanting to work in Norway or looking to maybe hire Norwegian? Where should they go? Or what should they do to better understand the culture? Well. <laughs> I can attend my courses and read my books, of course. Uh. Yeah. And then read and listen and ask Norwegians, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Hmm. And isn't it also true that most, because in Norway has something that is very interesting. They have, um, in every big city around the world, they have a seafood council. And they usually have like a, a celebration on our constitution day, the 17th of May. Oh yes, uh, and you can actually find most of these things around the world. So if you ever want to meet Norwegians, look for on the calendar for the seventeenth of May and see if you can find any celebrations around your city. Uh, mm -hmm. Anywhere in the world, you might find something, and you can go there and you can talk to some Norwegian if you have a very particular interest in in working with them. Yeah, I don't think there's any other countries celebrating the National Day, or or actually, it's the Constitution Day. Uh, more than Norwegians, they will celebrate all over the world. It's a very big day. Mm. Yeah, no, it's it's so big that uh, I was once in in uh, Seattle, uh, in the northwest of US and Washington State, and they have a big 17th of May celebration there. Uh, but I think that there was only maybe one percent Norwegians. The rest are Americans or so descendant of Norwegians. Uh, and it was super interesting, very fascinating, and sort of makes you very proud as a Norwegian to see that. But anywhere in the world, you will find. So I think this is a this is also a way to sort of find them if you if you feel like you want to interact with them. And I think that if you are already planning to move there or you have a job uh, coming up or something, 
and you want to get some introduction, it's it's a very good way to go. Um, and as I said, with the Seafood Council, which is also very unique, we always have like people, Norwegians living in in cities and they do events and they do different kind of uh, activities there for um, the communities of Norwegians and also places where there are not many Norwegians. They, they also do events. And so Yeah, and you could maybe look up the Chamber of Commerce because there are lots of Norwegian, for instance, Norwegian Chinese and uh, Norwegian Spanish and so on, uh, Chamber of Commerce. Yeah. So you could look them up and see if they are located um, where you live and uh, maybe join them. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I think the best solution um, for now is actually to look up uh, Karen online at elisculture.com. You will find a lot of information there for sure uh, about working with Norwegians. Okay, before we really end it, is there anything else you wanted to, to mention or add that we haven't talked about so far that you think is important for the listener to, to know about? Yes, I would like to tell a little story um, because that illustrates what I have already been talking about. Um, there was a, a professor at one of the universities in Norway who discovered that people who came to Norway from some cultures, um, after spending some years in Norway, their careers came to a halt. They did not have the development that one should have expe expected. So when they came to Norway, they were stars in the country they came from with top grades and everything. And you should have expected them to develop in Norway, but they did not. So um, and then he started looking at the U.S. to compare. And he found that in the U.S., similar kind of talents in the U.S. really excelled. But in Norway, they did not. They stagnated. And then he went and asked these um talents who had come to Norway but uh, had not had a, a, a very good career in Norway. So he asked them what had happened and they all told the same story. They said that when we came to Norway we had every opportunity but nobody told us. So this is a lack of clarity again. And where we came from if if we had done something that the boss had not asked for us uh, asked us to do we would have lost a job. So we had every opportunity, but we did not dare to take it. And now we understand that we had the opportunity and, and it's too late. So they had wasted, typically wasted maybe three years, not where their career had come to a halt because they had not understood that in Norway you have every opportunity, uh, but you need to take it. So this is my message to you. If you come to work in Norway, you have every opportunity but you need to take it yourself because nobody will tell you usually. Hmm. Yeah, no, it, it it illustrates greatly the sort of the our um, the way of thinking and, and the way of life, and it sort of it, it flows through the, this, the our blood and society and how we think about you know each other and everything that you have all the opportunity and we are given all these opportunities as well. Mm. It's a yeah. it's something that the, we we are blessed with in, in many ways that it is a great country to live in and i think that the reason it is great um and why we score really high on on different indexes is that we are we there's very little limitations of what you can do and achieve um and i think it's actually a misconception sometimes that uh, they say the land of free is somewhere else but maybe we can say the norwegian is the land of free because we have so much option and so much opportunity and it's given to you and you can take it and you can you can have a lot of success uh, in Norway. But it's also independent work taken to extremes. Uh, so uh, you need to understand that you are expected to work independently. And very seldom will there be any sanctions. So there's a high tolerance for making mistakes because there will be mistakes in such an unclear environment. Uh, but we have a high tolerance uh, for trial and failure so we see trial and failure as uh, part of the le learning process yeah okay that's amazing i'm really happy with everything we talked about so far i want to thank you so much for your time um before we end it uh i want you to to tell the the listener uh or if you're watching where they can learn more about you and, and find uh, find your your services Yes, I suggest you look up elisculture.com uh, on the internet, or you can find us on uh, Elis Culture as Elis Culture on Facebook or on LinkedIn. 
Perfect. And and how do you do you get a lot of requests and stuff on LinkedIn? Do you are, are you able to respond to everything? Yes, I do. So yeah. Uh, yeah. And uh, so I have uh, e-learning courses about working with Norwegians and applying for jobs in Norway. I have the books and I can also do uh, classroom courses for companies. Mm. Yeah. So that you you heard that you can you can learn about Norway. You don't have to go there. You can attend the e-learning course from uh, Karen and you yeah. will get all the value you need. Or an online class. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. Yeah. Super. Thank you very much, Karen. I, I hope this episode was as interesting as uh, for me as it was for you. Uh, I love learning about different cultures and obviously being a Norwegian myself, I think um, it's kind of a, I'm talking about myself here, so I might be very biased. I am biased. I wouldn't say anything else, but I think it's just an eye opener to try to also for people that, that if you don't really understand your own culture, it's also difficult to try to understand other cultures. So I think it's a good learning experience and i hope a lot of norwegians are listening to this as well because you can you should definitely get uh, karen's book and just start reading it because it's it's a fun book to read and it gives you a lot of insights and things that you take for granted and um, i thank you very much for for all your insights and all your um your, all your valuable uh, information and um i will add all the information and everything we talked about uh in the show notes of this uh, podcast uh, they will also be available on uh, the website that will come, uh, workingwithus.co. Uh, the transcription of the interview, links to all resources, to Karen's uh, uh, services and everything we will find there. And um, yeah, I, I think that's it. And um, I thank you again so much for your time, Karen. Uh, what, what's next for you today? Oh, clearing the snow. It's snowing outside. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the typical Norwegian uh, afternoon tradition or even before w going to work tradition. So remember that if you work with Norwegians and they don't arrive at the office early, it's because they had to clear the snow from the driveway because we do that ourselves. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Okay. Have a great day. Thank and thank, um, you, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.